Despite what it looks like, these trucks are actually not on fire. These are some of North Korea's famous smoker trucks. And these are trucks that are powered by coal or biomass gasifier engines. You can see one of these engines illustrated on the top right. And obviously that doesn't look like a brand spanking new technology, does it? This gasifier engine technology is over a century old and it was utilized extensively during World War II in contexts where liquid fuels were really scarce. But as you can see here, it's a dirty technology and it's wildly energy inefficient. So when you see these trucks in North Korea, often they're pulled over at the side of the road, just smoking, doing nothing like this. And that's because they have to stop regularly because they overheat and they produce this horrible acrid smoke. Now, this is not the type of technology that would be in mass usage unless you had a liquid fuels crisis, unless liquid fuels were unavailable or in short supply. So in the DPRK, these smoker trucks are indicative of energy shock. They're a signpost of the economic collapse, the energy shortages that were brought on by the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991. And indeed, they're an ingenious adaptation to these oil shortages and energy shock. And they make a pertinent entry point to the topic of this video as we explore the role of energy shock in triggering the famine and economic collapse of the arduous March period. I'll lay out the story like this. We'll begin looking at North Korea's structural energy insecurity. We'll examine the Soviet collapse and how the resultant energy shock rippled through North Korea's economy. We'll look at the systemic crisis created by this energy shock in both the economic sector and in agriculture, which led to the Great Famine, the arduous march period. We'll finish off by looking at the legacies of the arduous march, including permanent food insecurity and how energy and food insecurity shapes North Korea's foreign policy choices right up to today. Since its inception, North Korea has always been energy insecure, and thus it's always been vulnerable to precisely the kind of energy shock that occurred in 1991. So what does this mean? What does it mean for a country to be energy insecure? To answer that, let's start with American energy expert Daniel Jurgen and his classic definition of energy security which is the ability of a state to access adequate, reliable supplies of energy at reasonable prices and in ways that don't jeopardize national values and objectives. So to briefly unpack that, adequate supplies, that relates to does the state have enough energy to service the needs of its economy? Reliable supplies, well, is the supply both regular and predictable? such that economic activity is not, uh, not disrupted. Reasonable prices, where the price is not too high, that it depresses economic activity, not too low, that it makes an incentive for oil producers to produce less, and that the price isn't volatile, where it yo-yos up and down and damages both producers and consumers. And then the national objectives and values part, what does the government have to do to ensure that adequate and reliable supply? So that's where its foreign policy objectives and behaviours come into play. So keep this point in mind in particular when we think about North Korea. All of these dimensions of supply and price are interlinked and they influence each other. Let's look at this relationship between production and consumption more closely here. The global map on the left illustrates the global distribution of proven oil reserves by country. And note here that neither North nor South Korea have any significant proven oil reserves relative to what you see in the major oil producing states. The map on the right shows potential oil fields in North Korea. Now these oil provinces are not in production and there's a few reasons for this. So for one, North Korea lacks the technical capacity of its own to develop an oil industry, and it's not willing to bring in foreign oil companies to develop these fields. Another reason, international economic sanctions. This makes it difficult for any entity, whether that's the DPRK government or a foreign oil company, to bring in the machinery and the technology that's required for oil exploration and drilling. 
But most importantly, the estimated size of these reserves is quite small. So the, ex the economics of exploration and drilling doesn't really stack up. So, you know, if North Korea was sitting on top of a Saudi Arabia sized oil field, for example, then they'd find a way and international investors would find a way because the bounty would be worth it. But it's not. So inevitably, this means that North Korea is import dependent for oil and petroleum based products. Now, I should point out, though, that North Korea is super resource rich. It just doesn't have any reserves of oil and gas of any significance. The map here illustrates where some of the major mineral deposits are, as well as some of the major processing facilities in the DPRK. What the North does have plenty of, though, is coal, and this is a significant contributor to North Korea's energy portfolio, particularly as a fuel source for electricity. Coal is also used in a raw form as coal briquettes called yantan, which have been used since the 19th century in Korea for home heating. Nonetheless, it's oil that's the critical resource for powering a 20th century industrial economy. Oil is critical to transportation and logistics, as clearly illustrated in this basic supply chain diagram here. If the oil price goes up, the cost of transportation goes up, and therefore the overall cost of the product. And if there's no oil, it becomes extremely difficult to impossible to keep supply chains running. During the Kim Il-sung era and the Cold War, North Korea was integrated into the greater Soviet economic system, including the USSR as the center of that system and the other countries in the international communist bloc. The Soviet Union was one of the world's largest oil producers, and it was the source of North Korea's oil imports, which the North received at heavily subsidized prices and also as direct aid. So this was the oil, this was the fuel upon which North Korea's mechanized agricultural system and its heavy industrial sector was based and was wholly reliant. This data shows North Korea's complete and total dependency on imported oil and oil refined products in 1990, prior to the Soviet collapse. When the Soviet Union did fall in 1991, what also fell was North Korea's economic lifeline to the outside world and its pipeline in for imported crude oil. Imports of crude oil from the Soviet Union declined precipitously from 440,000 tonnes in 1990 to only 40,000 tonnes in 1991. So if we interpret this story through Daniel Jurgen's definition of energy security, we can clearly see the magnitude of this shock to oil supplies for North Korea. The supply of imported oil very rapidly declined and what was available was grossly inadequate for the existing demand for oil and liquid fuels. The supply was highly unreliable. So even though some oil imports did get through, they arrived sporadically and unpredictably, and often in the form of ad hoc aid shipments. Price was also part of the issue. The North Korean government was unable to purchase oil on the international market because it lacked the foreign currency reserves to buy oil at market prices in US dollars, which is what international oil markets are denominated in. Now, this is where the national values and objectives part of Daniel Jurgen's energy security definition comes into play. The North Korean government chose to privilege the maintenance of the command economy and the maintenance of its closed political system over some of the economic reforms and economic opening that would have been required to obtain oil on the international market. And that choice continues to lock the North Korean government into a very narrow set of options, which explain a lot about its foreign policy behavior. And I'll come back to this point later in the video. It's surprising to recall now that in 1970, North Korea was the most industrialized society in Northeast Asia. So for a highly industrialized society like the DPRK, the scale of the 1991 energy shock meant awful things for the state of its economy. 
Factories had to shut down production. There was either no energy to power them or the supply chains that supplied them with resources for production completely collapsed. Factory workers were not paid their wage in rations, yet they were still required to come to work to satisfy ideological requirements. And the consequence of that was that women were not burdened by having to come to work, they were free to pursue survival and adaptation strategies. So this, this is where the space emerged for women to get involved in entrepreneurial activities. And the previously privileged industrial work workforce faced starvation during the famine. No ration, plus no space or access to agricultural produce because they're living in urban areas rather than in the countryside. You can see the difference in industrial output in this graph, which compares energy demand between 1990, prior to the energy shock, and 1996, which is when the, the arduous march is in full swing. So industrial output is estimated to have declined, and even still by 2019, up to 60% from 1990 levels. So it's never really recovered since that time. As a result of this rapid economic implosion, the command economy splintered into a number of distinct parallel economies. Now, the emergence of parallel economies, this is a phenomenon that can occur in any country when its official economy becomes too rigid and too dysfunctional. And this, this usually occurs when it's under stress. Command economies in communist states were particularly prone to this phenomenon. However, parallel economies can emerge in capitalist systems as well. In North Korea, five distinct parallel economies emerged during the arduous march. You can see these listed here. I'll go into them shortly. There's considerable overlap between them, but each one of these parallel economies is unique from the others. And in more importantly, they're all distinctive from the old command system that preceded them. In other videos, we've discussed the emergence of marketization as a coping strategy during the famine. This marketization, this represents the entrepreneurial economy, which grew from black market entrepreneurial activities outside of official channels. The entrepreneurial economy grew from and continues to exist today in parallel with the remnants of the old command economy, including the hollowed out shell of, he of the heavy industrial sector and the centralized collective agricultural system. We've also discussed the emergence of the Korean People's Army as an important economic player during the arduous march through Kim Il-sung's Songun politics model. Within this military economy, entire production chains were subsumed under military control. Now today, while Songun has been de-emphasized under Kim Jong-un, this structure of the parallel military economy remains intact. There also emerged during the arduous march an extensive illicit economy. The end of subsidized imports from the USSR badly exposed North Korea's lack of foreign currency income. So illegal activities became one of the few realistic sources of income for the government. This illicit economy has both state and non-state elements. So on the one hand, the North Korean government engages in criminal activities to generate foreign currency earnings. And this included criminal enterprises based on drug running and production, counterfeiting of foreign currency and cigarettes, money laundering, shadow banking and insurance fraud, and now even cybercrime. On the other hand, illicit activities have also emerged outside of official channels in which well-placed individuals have established their own illegal operations, often related to drug production and sale. Now, unlike government or the government's drug operation, which is largely an export industry, private drug entrepreneurs are selling methamphetamine and opioids to street buyers in North Korea itself. The final parallel economy is the court economy. This is a shadow market for the regime elite through which they can source luxury goods. So that's anything from fine hard liquor to Mercedes Benzes. Importation of luxury goods into the North is prohibited by the UN sanctions regime. However, the North Korean government is able to draw on its illicit networks to source luxury goods outside of sanctions control. For the Kims, 
The court economy serves as an incentive to buy the ongoing loyalty of high-ranking officials in the government, as well as in the party and the military. So supply the elites with goodies to keep them wanting to be loyal to you. The fracturing of the economy was echoed in and reinforced by the collapse of the food system. When we think of a food system, we're not just talking about farms and crops. As illustrated here in this basic diagram, food systems incorporate the entire production chain of food producers and food consumers, as well as farming inputs, logistics and distribution networks. Food systems are also nested within larger environmental, political and economic systems. So when those larger systems are under stress, food systems can break down. And when food systems break down, it can have a mutually reinforcing impact on politics and economies. More importantly, breakdowns in food systems impact directly on the people who depend on those food systems for their sustenance. Looking at the food system diagram here, you can see how an energy shock might ripple through the entire food system with compounding impacts. Remember from previous videos that under Kim Il-sung's program of agricultural collectivization during the 1950s, North Korea's farms were organized as essentially open air factories. Prior to 1991, North Korea's agricultural sector was heavily mechanized, making extensive use of tractors and other heavy farm machinery in industrializing the nation's food system on its enormous collective farms. This industrial food system model also made extensive use of chemical, fer chemical fertilizers, pesticides and herbicides to boost agricultural yields. And indeed, this system was extremely energy intensive and it was dependent on oil. This time series graph from the website 38 North illustrates the precipitous drop in food production through the early 1990s. And it illustrates the, how the energy shock brought North Korea's food system to its knees through this period. Without oil imported from the USSR, agricultural production almost ground to a halt. Without that oil, agriculture was essentially demechanized and that meant that the industrial machinery like tractors and harvesters, etc., couldn't be used. Without the labor-saving power of that farm machinery, farming had to be done by hand, by people, with the help of beasts of burden. Now, when you travel through North Korea, this is really obvious. Like when you, there's so many people around through the countryside, in the fields, walking along the roads, etc. Contrast that when you work, uh, travel through the countryside in Australia, you hardly see anyone. And that's because a lot of farm labor is done mechanically here. So what that means without the use of uh, machinery, harvesting and food distribution was so much slower after the energy shock of 1991. The lack of oil for tractors also, along with significant reductions in the amount of fertilizer that was able to be imported, this made it much harder to replenish the soil fertility. So declining soil fertility then also means decreasing crop yields over time because the soil just doesn't have the nutrients for good crop growth. The decimation of the food system led to the Great Famine what official media in the DPRK refer to as the arduous march. The arduous march was a major calamity for the North Korean people. It was an extremely traumatic event, during which time the economy failed and the North Korean state itself nearly collapsed. It was an extreme socioeconomic dislocation, and this event continues to resonate to this day. North Korea has never really recovered from this event. During the Kim Il-sung era, food was centrally distributed to the people through something called the Public Distribution System, or PDS. Centralised distribution was necessary because the command economy distorted the balance of supply and demand, and that forced the government to decide how to distribute scarce commodities like food. And also, centralising food distribution, that is 
a measure of social control. That creates a dependency between the people and the state, which is good for centralization of power. Now, to collect the public distribution system rations, a representative from each family unit would present their ID and rationing coupons uh, at the local PDS center to receive the rations for their family. And these rations usually consisted of rice and a number of different grains. But during the structural food crisis of the mid 1990s, the PDS system broke down and this exposed millions of North Koreans to an abrupt food shock for which they were not at all prepared. The most reliable and widely cited study on the death toll of the famine comes from Daniel Goodkind and Lorraine West, published in 2001. In this study, they estimated approximately 600,000 deaths from starvation, although estimates across a range of sources go from about 200,000 people at the low end to over 2 million deaths at the upper end. Apart from those who died, there was a generation of kids who grew up during this period stunted by malnutrition. The people were essentially left to fend for themselves. The state retreated, the PDS collapsed, and what food that was allocated by the government was passed out on the basis of Songun politics, so that diverted a lot of food to the military, as well as the Songun class system. And so this was essentially a government response that was based on triage, where they made choices about who would starve and who would get food. The famine turned North Korea's class hierarchies on their head. Ironically though, even with Songbun class privileges, many people living in the urban centers were more vulnerable to starvation because of their distance from food production. So they couldn't steal food, couldn't grow food, there wasn't food available on the street for people to barter to the same extent that there was in regional areas. So that distance from food production turned out to be a real liability under famine conditions. Likewise, the people who were previously discriminated against because of their foreign family connections were able to cope because they were getting remittances of foreign currency from relatives abroad. There was also the inversion of gender hierarchies that I've spoken about previously, with women emerging as the vanguard of the new entrepreneurial class. The famine and its extreme social dislocations undermined official state controls. So travel restrictions and controls over internal movement, these broke down because people were on the move looking for food. I mean, they had to, they had to find food wherever they could find it, whether that was traveling outside of their home area, going into forest areas to forage for food, doing whatever they had to do to survive. Corruption became rampant at all levels of society as the need to obtain food, the need to obtain foreign currency. As survival measures, these began to override loyalty to the state and override any fears of the threat of punishment. So as this was happening, the mythology of the official, the official story was seriously challenged. There was no spinning the gap between rhetoric and reality as these social dislocations of the famine are unrolling. North Korea's food system has never fully rebounded from the arduous march, and the country remains in permanent structural food deficit. So there's a number of factors that re reduce the availability of food. For one, North Korea's lack of arable land for farming has always been a major structural constraint on food production. There's the UN economic sanctions, fuel restrictions, and the lack of appropriate farm machinery and equipment, which has had a huge impact on industrialization and industrialized agriculture in the DPRK. But we can't look past the government either. Either The government's policy of self-reliance, its lack of foreign currency revenue, the structure of the economy and how that structure splintered apart, severe constraints on the food security situation. And on top of that, you've got extreme weather events. So you've got extreme natural disasters that are a regular occurrence every year through North Korea. You get lengthy dry spells, but then the typhoons and the associated floods 
These do enormous damage to farmland and drive down crop yields, uh, which exacerbates all these other issues that contribute to food insecurity. As the food system has become marketized, imported food from China has really bailed out the North Korean government and it's reduced some of the demand for foreign aid and reduced some of the structural pressure of food insecurity. But marketization has also increased socioeconomic inequality. So if you've got foreign currency, you can buy whatever foodstuffs you need in the Jiangmudang markets. But if you don't have access to foreign currency, you're much more vulnerable to food insecurity and malnutrition. Food consumption levels remain low countrywide and dietary diversity remains very poor. And that's particularly for people who aren't able to buy food through the Jiangmudang. A number of food related coping strategies have been widely adopted, including reducing consumption by adults so that their children can eat and also by reducing meal sizes. Urban households who we've already shown are quite exposed to food insecurity. If they've got relatives who live in rural areas, then they rely on those relatives to send them food where they can as well. Timely injections of foreign aid during the late 1990s were significant in heading off the total failure of the state's institutions. Indeed, these propped up the food system at a really important time. Now that international largesse came in a variety of forms. It came as direct food aid, so you know, like bags of rice, etc. It came as energy supplies. It came in fertilizers, as well as development assistance and direct cash payments. United Nations agencies are a major source of food aid. And the footage in the video here shows a World Food Program rice shipment being loaded up in Thailand to be sent to the DPRK. Now, why Thailand? Well, that's where the UN's Asia office is based in the Thai capital, Bangkok. Then there's also bilateral food aid. So for South Korea and China, who were the two primary conduits of food aid into North Korea, they can see aid as an investment in regional stability, aid as preventing the doomsday scenario that they fear, which is North Korean state collapse and enormous refugee flows. There's also a number of non-government organizations and NGOs that provide food aid into the North at lower levels. I recommend that you memorize Daniel Jurgen's seminal definition of energy security. Because energy security, it's like a pattern language that explains a great deal about international relations and foreign policy decision making in North Korea and elsewhere. And that pattern language is very clear in the North Korean case, though. Without oil reserves of its own, ongoing oil import dependency is an obvious ongoing restraint for the North Koreans. China has been North Korea's major source of fuel oil, along with Russia to a much lesser extent. But this is potentially a major source of leverage that China and Russia have over the North Korean government. So energy producers always have leverage over energy consumers. It also means that if the US and its allies ever want to negotiate a peace agreement with North Korea, then providing ongoing reliable energy assistance to the DPRK would be a good and useful part of this mix. North Korea's energy import dependencies highlight its larger overall trade dependency with China. Over 90% of North Korea's two-way trade goes through the PRC, transiting at places like the Dandong Shiniju crossing over the Yalu River, pictured on the bottom here, or the Kwanhe Wanjong bridge crossing over the Tumen River, pictured at the top. Of course, during the COVID pandemic, this connection to China has been heavily restricted by North Korea's own border closures. Indeed, it's ironic that for over two decades, international economic sanctions were undermined by Chinese support for the DPRK, but it's North Korea's own COVID-related border closures that have achieved the type of economic strangula strangulation of the North that was envisaged by the economic sanctions regime itself. North Korea's energy and food insecurities 
also established the fundamental needs and rationale for some of Pyongyang's more provocative foreign policy behaviours. Principally, its historic pattern of engineering small-scale military crises in order to extract food and energy concessions from the international community, something called coercive diplomacy. So the idea here was that the North would engage in pinprick provocations to extract food and oil aid. So not anything that would engender a full military response from the US and South Korea, but something that would engineer a diplomatic crisis and then uh, as a payment for de-escalation, the food aid and the oil aid and cash aid and other goodies would be given by the international community to North Korea. So that coercive diplomacy model segues into our upcoming topic on North Korean foreign policy and strategic culture, where we'll explore this pattern of coercive diplomacy in more detail. So let's tease out some generalizable observations from today's topic. Energy and food systems are inextricably linked and both are shaped by politics, economy and environment. Historically, famines have been shown to be man-made events rather than Malthusian natural occurrences. And this is something that we get from the great Brazilian economist Amartya Sen for his seminal study on famines that makes this argument. And the North Korean famine certainly fits this pattern. In the North Korean case, we see the importance of supply chains and logistics networks in the story of the famine. And I'm sure I don't have to remind you about the importance of supply chain disruptions, given our own experiences with these during the COVID pandemic. But while we've been inconvenienced by short-term supply chain disruptions, it's when these disruptions become normalized, it's when they become embedded over the long term that you see systemic breakdown. And finally, I want to reiterate my point about energy security as a pattern language that explains a great deal about international relations and foreign policy decision making for all countries, not just North Korea. So for aspiring international relations analysts, energy security as a pattern language is well worth becoming better acquainted with. In prepping for the assessment related to this topic, these key points are salient to keep in mind.